Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to the National CyberWatch Center webinar series. Uh, today's mod or today's uh, webinar is on a automotive security module that has been developed by a professor at uh, Northern Virginia Community College. Um, so we ask that you keep your microphone muted when you're not talking. Uh, and if you do have questions, you can do uh, one of two things. You can enter it in chat. Uh, make sure you send it to everyone so everybody can see your question. And then at the end of the webinar, we'll uh, respond to those questions. You can also hold your questions to the end and open your microphone and ask questions that way too, either of those. Obviously, we've been experiencing some uh, technical issues. Don't know what they were. Uh, it was apparently something on the uh, WebEx end of things, unfortunately. So uh, we had to restart the meeting. Uh, thank you for your patience and thank you for uh, joining us back if you're able to. Uh, so uh, just to let you know a little bit about the webinar series, uh, we do uh, send new topics out. Uh, if you have topic suggestions, please send them to the email address that you see on your screen, info at nationalcyberwatch.org. That's I-N-F-O at nationalcyberwatch.org. This meeting is being recorded. Uh, it will be uh, put on the National Cyber Watch Center YouTube channel, and you see the address there on your screen. It will uh, also be sent to you. Uh, you'll get an email if you entered your email address when you uh, join the meeting. You'll be sent an invitation to the meeting space at the end, which will contain a uh, recording of this webinar. So my name is Lewis Leitner. I'm the Operations Director of the National Cyber Watch Center. I'll be moderating the meeting, and at the end, uh, I'll be taking the questions and answers. So our presenter today is Reggie Bennett. Reggie Bennett is a professor uh, in automotive technology at Northern Virginia Community College. Uh, Reggie, how are you doing today? I'm doing just fine. Great. All right. So it's all yours. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, as uh, Lewis said, I'm uh, a professor of automotive technology here at the Northern Virginia Community College. Um, my areas of specialization are in like automotive electronics, uh, emission controls, drivability, and uh, in general, a lot of this came about over the last uh, couple of semesters when I've taught our capstone automotive electronics course and trying to address some of the issues that we've probably all been seeing, whether we're in the IT industry or the automotive industry or anything else that have been pretty well publicized. Um, going all the way back to probably the 2009 era with uh, the sudden acceleration on Toyota and Lexus vehicles and some um, analysis of that particular problem. So with automotive cybersecurity and the fact that we have virtually electronics controlling uh, almost every system uh, on a modern automobile, SUV, light truck, or anything of that nature, um, there's a lot of different vulnerabilities that have been researched and been exposed, and a lot of the, uh, if you want to say, cybersecurity community, there's people that have certainly, in fact, some friends of mine that are software engineers that have said, yeah, you know, we thought this was probably going to be a problem, but, uh, you know, nobody's really spent a lot of time looking into it, either at the manufacturer level, the supplier level. Uh, and I'll be happy to address some of the things that are currently in progress that are kind of an update to the study that's the basis of these PowerPoint slides that we're going to be looking at here um, as we go through the uh, meeting. So um, if you can move us to the first slide on there. Uh, these are going to be excerpts from uh, the experimental security analysis of a modern automobile. Now, this is conducted by a joint study group, the University of Washington and the University of California at San Diego, called the Center for Automotive Electronics Systems Security. Um, they have done a couple of studies. Uh, this is the earlier of the two. The later one that uh, is basically titled, uh, and let me give you the title here of their the more current one, is Comprehensive Experimental Analyses of automotive attack surfaces. So this is from the earlier work that they did, but there's a lot of this that still applies to the majority of vehicles that are 
on our roads and highways today in the United States, and not only the United States, but actually globally, uh, wherever there's the degree of technology that we have that's common to mostly the American transportation system, if you will, and uh, the vehicles associated with it. So if we can go to the, I want to make sure I give them full credit for this because they're the basis of a lot of this, uh, of the module, and I've kind of bullet pointed it and highlighted some things in it. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so these are some of the typical cybersecurity issues that we have um, for a host of reasons, starting primarily with um, the tightening of both emission controls and the CAPE or corporate average fuel economy standards uh, over the last two decades. We've, uh, there's been one solution for improving emissions, vehicle drivability, uh, fuel economy, and things of that nature, and that has basically been driven by electronics and, uh, moreover, software. So, uh, as I tell my students, the secret's really in the software on a lot of these systems and how well the software is designed. Um, a question that I put in for my electronics students was, what does an automotive computer do again? And at its most basic function, the computer is designed, and we all know that we have three stages of basically when we're talking about any computer, which is sense, basically what we're familiar with in the normal PC or IT world, which would be our peripherals. Uh, in the automotive world, it's going to be a variety of data sensors or inputs that are basically electrical signals, oftentimes are uh, variable voltages, digital, digitized signals, things like that. Uh, and then we have, of course, the decide section of the computer, which is going to include our processing, uh, our various levels of memory like RAM, ROM, PROM, uh, and on newer vehicles, of course, is going to be in a double EEPROM or electronically erasable programmable memory, and of course the processing functions. And going through particularly the last decade, the average computing power of most automotive computers, particularly those related to engine controls and vehicle safety systems, has just exploded. Um, computer speeds, things like that, have gotten a lot faster than they were initially back in the days of um, in 1980, 81, where we first started, um, let's say, putting electronic engine controls on vehicles, uh, where we had transmission speeds of a lowly 160 baud. That was the standard baud rate at the time. And we've gone way over that right now. Uh, as you can see on the slide, a typical luxury sedan contains 100 megabytes of binary code. There's just literally millions and millions of lines of code that are, uh, let's say, if you will, embedded in um, a number of these modules. And then to complicate things even more, uh, it's not uncommon for a late model vehicle throughout the last decade, particularly something on the medium to high end scale, uh, that would actually have as many as 60 to 80 separate nodes, computers, modules communicating with, with each other on uh, anywhere from 10 to 12 different networks, which would have different proto uh, communication protocols or basically uh, communication languages, if you will. Um, new software has been introduced, of course, to create sa to increase safety, vehicle efficiency, and customer convenience. Uh, the increasing degree of computer controls also brings with it a corresponding array of threats, which we'll hope to address some of that today. And one of the things also that's working in terms of customer convenience, we're starting to view the vehicle itself, of uh, what we would call the platform of the vehicle structure, as actually something similar to having an iPhone or a Samsung Galaxy. Right now, unbeknownst to most drivers, operators of vehicles, um, there are numerous software updates, just like we update on a probably a more regular basis most of our IT products, whether it's a, a smartphone, whether it's a netbook or a notebook or a desktop computer or a laptop computer, it really doesn't matter, or iPad or a tablet, um, there's these same types of updates that affect automobiles as well and uh, the computing systems. So this is a, a challenge as well. There's an, there was an estimate about four or five years ago that when it comes to the engine control system software, 
that approximately 70 to 80 percent of all the vehicles out there are running basically outdated control software. So there are some issues there as well, and that's another uh, issue where another attack, um, let's say vector uh, or attack uh, possibility is there also in the fact of doing these updates because of the interface involved with personal computers, either at the dealership level or even at independent or fleet shops as well that would be servicing and repairing vehicles. Um, we can move on to the, uh, to the next screen, if you would. Okay. Now, these are some of the possible vehicle attack entry points. And the number one direct uh, link would be through the OBD data link. Now, for those of you that are not aware of, starting in 1996, and there was some beta work that was done prior to that by several manufacturers in what we called OBD, or Onboard Diagnostics, Generation 1, uh, to what we currently have as an EPA or U.S. Environmental Protection Agency standard starting in 1996, which was Onboard Diagnostics Generation 2. And this is basically where we have, when it comes to the emission control systems on the vehicle, we have pretty much a common format referred to as SAE or Society of Automotive Engineers Standard J1979 that governs the various modes of information that we can obtain from any vehicle, regardless of manufacture, whether it's a Ferrari, a Ford, whether it's a Hyundai or a Hummer, whether it's a Porsche or a Pontiac, it makes absolutely no difference. But these particular protocols are shared by all these manufacturers uh, to get basic emission control system data. Um, this is, of course, I, it's another whole separate subject, and that happens to be one of my areas of expertise is vehicle emissions. Um, but there's a lot of things with the OBD link that also is our, if you want to say, our interface, uh, where as technicians um, in my field, you can actually hook up to the vehicle um, and either wirelessly or cabled, and you are able to not only get in and look at information, live data, things like that on the various modules in the vehicle with what we call an enhanced scan tool, an enhanced scan tool software, but also we can do some of the things that are part of the cybersecurity problem, and that would be the, uh, the what we call bidirectional or active testing that we can do, where we can actually turn components on and off with the scan tool, okay? And uh, that's another, another whole area. Also, the OBD data link is also where reflashing or reprogramming, basically updating uh, system software on many, or if not all, of these modules on the vehicle, again, depending on the type of scan tool you have and uh, software capabilities, uh, this is one of the, the main points of entry. Now, of course, it does require that you uh, have to directly access that OBD data link connector. The next area, and one that is, I think, a little bit frightening, is the telematic units. And these are things like that most of you are probably familiar with, with things like OnStar. European manufacturers also have uh, some of their own types of uh, systems as well that are very similar to OnStar and some of their higher-end cars like BMW and Mercedes-Benz. Uh, but basically, the telematics allow, it's sort of, in a sense, what we talk about with onboard diagnostics and the evolution of that, it's like OBD3, where basically you've got telematics or a lot of people refer to it as like big brother in your car. Um, this is one of the other vectors uh, for possible attack. The other devices come from things more in the infotainment and the integration of, let's say, personal electronics, such as a smartphone or cell phone. Even something that we take like a hands-free device where we have um, a cellular phone that basically we can hook up and of course hands-free, which would be uh, certainly a, a, an improvement to vehicle safety. It keeps the vehicle operator or driver from fumbling around, trying to fool around with the phone while they're driving, especially if they want to use it for a GPS function or something, of course, like voice-activated uh, functions like the Surrey type thing, um, but it also happens to be a um, another attack avenue 
for malware, um, different types of virus attacks, things like that, and indirect and direct attacks to the vehicle. Um, replacement parts containing software. There's always the possibility because of the fact that the automotive industry is truly and has been for many decades a global enterprise. Things are manufactured all over the world uh, that wind up in the end unit we call um, you know, a passenger car or a light truck or a, you know, a sport utility vehicle or any of those types of things. So there's always a possibility that we can have malware that can be introduced. And the more we have different types of modules or things like that uh, on the vehicle, uh, the greater the possibility that we could have something uh, of that nature. Also, replacement parts that may not meet robust quality standards, and like I said, I'll get into a couple of those that exist right now regarding vehicle safety and control systems, both on the ISO side as well as SAE. Um, the other, of course, has always been a problem on vehicles is add-on and aftermarket devices such as remote starters, uh, more high-end types of audio uh, types of systems, even like audio-visual systems and things in the vehicle. Um, many of these types of devices carry with them sometimes, again, not, uh, not very robust security measures, particularly where software is involved, um, particularly like in some of the uh, like theft deterrent systems, uh, anti-theft devices and all that might be on the vehicle or what we call immobilizers, uh, certainly remote starters or another avenue because a lot of those are basically RFID control. And then the final thing is, as we start to see the move toward different levels of vehicle autonomy, uh, is the V2B, vehicle-to-vicle -vehicle interface, as well as the vehicle-to-infrastructure infra, inf, uh, infrastructure, uh, that particular type of interface, and wireless systems. Uh, wireless system uh, attacks can be either short-range or they can be long range as well. And those also are another uh, problem that um, for, let's say, cybersecurity, uh, if you will, types of uh, protections that we want to build into the vehicle. Okay, we can go to the next slide now. Okay, now although there's approximately 250 million registered passenger cars in the US with the vast majority having significant computer control, these systems are largely unfamiliar to the computer security community. It's not that they have like, you know, uh, fabulously complex programming languages. Most of the programming languages that are used on most automotive controllers, particularly engine controls or C++ or microcontroller are the two most common types of programming languages. I am not a programming expert. I have a little bit of knowledge of uh, coding from, uh, messing around with Arduino with my younger children um, and just some other things that I've been experimenting with lately in the electronics realm I'll be happy to address uh, later on. Um, but what we have is the trend in automotive technology is the increasing deployment of semi-autonomous systems such as what we call adaptive cruise control and automa automatic braking. Um, and these are typically what we refer to, there's uh, five different levels in what we want to call vehicle autonomy or semi-autonomy. There's the level zero where there's basically no control. There's level one, which is more like in the warning system area. There's level two, which is the example I've given here of a late model Audi Q7 that will automatically apply the brakes, completely stopping the vehicle if necessary with no driver input. And a lot of this is accomplished by both what we call uh, both short and long-range radar units in many cases, or uh, ultrasound using something very similar to sonar. Uh, there's a variety of different technologies that uh, are employed for, let's say, like uh, lane control, like keeping the vehicle in its lane so you're not doing lane drifting, things like that, as well as the adaptive cruise control to actually bring the vehicle to a complete stop if necessary uh, are often accomplished through, for instance, like uh, on many late model Cadillacs, we have up to six onboard uh, radar units that are operating roughly around a frequency of about 77 gigahertz. And these are all pretty much low power units, but they have an effective range in most cases of around, I want to say around the two 
100 to 300 meter range, depending on uh, how they're designed and what, what power level they're at. Um, now, the biggest problem is this last bullet down here on this particular slide. And this is often the bridging of safety-related system networks and other less critical networks like infotainment, um, other communication systems that might go into like a Bluetooth interface on the vehicle and things like that. Um, and this is especially the case, again, with telematics units such as OnStar. And I'm not picking specifically on OnStar because, as I said, a number of manufacturers have this, and OnStar also goes across. It's not originally was developed at General Motors, but it bridges a lot of different manufacturers use that, that particular OnStar application. Um, so I'm going to address that as to what is currently going on in the industry right now, particularly at General Motors, to um, address this bridging problem. But this is definitely one of the big ones we've got that's allowed the attacks that occurred in the uh, University of Washington and University of California San Diego studies. Okay, we can go to the next pane now, please. All right, also, this is the other thing. Hackers with a purpose, and this is the small but vibrant tuner subculture of automotive enthusiasts who utilize specialized software to primarily improve engine performance. This isn't anything new. Uh, there's been different things for any of you that are joining us that are in the uh, in the automotive community, whether you're in the performance community doing uh, you know, engine performance modifications, vehicle modifications, anything like that, or uh, you, know, you just uh, are maybe in the engineering side and have just uh, decided, hey, I want to do some stuff with my car here and I want to kind of bypass some things. We've had things out like different types of, uh, uh, let's say, devices called like Diablo Sport, Hypertech that have been around for a pretty good while. Um, again, you know, probably everyone here has probably seen some variants since there's about six or seven different episodes out now, Fast and Furious, and uh, that is one where you see all these late model sport compacts that uh, basically have had, uh, we used to do back in the old days when we had replaceable programmable renal and memories, we would put in what was called hot chips. Uh, hot chips are no longer possible because of the EPA standard of OBD2 starting in for real in 1996. So therefore, we have to have electronically erasable programmable read-only memories or replace the entire uh, electronic uh, or engine control module or powertrain control module if we want to change particular calibration features. We're going through the OBD data link connector port. It's possible with aftermarket types of either software applications on a, on a PC or uh, standalone units such as like the Diablo Sport or the Hypertech, you can actually go in and change things like spark advance curves, for instance, or your fuel program. You can increase your engine RPM if like a lot of late model uh, uh, vehicles have uh, sort of like what we call a rev limiter function and a speed limiter function. You can actually uh, change those around slightly. So there are some things that you can modify and edit in the software. Again, from a software engineering standpoint, you're going to be basically changing lines of code. Uh, a lot of these applications and tools make it a lot simpler to just simply ratchet up or ratchet down, like, for instance, like Spark Advance or when the engine cooling fan is turned on by the engine control module and such you know, uh, control features such as that. Um, the hardware and software required is relatively inexpensive and pretty much relatively available. And again, like they've seen a lot uh, doing research, a lot of different really low-cost methods of getting into, uh, uh, let's say, changing and altering some things around, as well as pretty low-cost programs that you can purchase in the $100 to $200 range. Uh, to actually make those alterations and just load it on a conventional PC like a laptop or a netbook or anything like that. Um, also, there's the, as we mentioned earlier, there's the increasing interest in moving toward uh, fully autonomous vehicles, uh, such as is the Google car, uh, the DARPA challenge, which is basically from Department of Defense, and also uh, I think all of us may be familiar with some of the good points, bad points of the Tesla autopilot. Uh, which heavily rely on wireless telematics, such as uh, 
vehicle to infrastructure, V2X, and then the vehicle to vehicle also, like peer to peer on that as well. And um, yeah, just uh, I think within the last week or so, I believe Apple has uh, come up with something as a uh, their particular variant of the Google car that they petitioned the California Department of Motor Vehicles for uh, permitting to allow it to operate on California highways. So uh, there's definitely you know, how fast this is going to develop and be used. Um, there's there's a lot of different issues here, both uh, legal there uh, legal issues with this, technical issues that have yet to be quite fixed. So there's a lot of like what we call level three and level four autonomy uh, that you know still is a definite work in progress, kind of like Webex. So uh, <laughs> the, we've still got a lot of things going on there that that are not settled in that area, let's say. There's a lot of really interesting technologies, a lot of what could be very robust and reliable technologies, but there's still a lot of both software and hardware issues that have to be ironed out yet, and particularly as we would have a larger uh, number of these vehicles in play on, on the road. Um, the particular study that's the center of these slides is using two 2009 passenger cars, and you may ask, well, okay, 2009, that's like, oh, that's like uh, seven or eight model years old. Well, the problem is, is there's a lot of vehicles out, still out on the road here. In fact, the average age of vehicles in the Washington metropolitan area, which is uh, a pretty, let's say, um, in terms of wealth and prosperity in the nation, it's probably uh, one of the leading areas, if you will, uh, for per capita income and things like that. So uh, we still have the average age of vehicles in the Washington metropolitan area probably is in the nine to 11 year range of age. So this is certainly well within that. And there's many of these types of cars out on the road. And again, I'm going to address some of the steps that one of the manufacturers has taken about that whole bridging problem here in just a little bit as well. Um, but they use 2009 passenger cars, same make and model. The risks identified in the study arise from the architecture of the modern automobile and not simply from design decisions made by any particular single manufacturer or what we call an OE. Uh, this is fundamental design issues that exist here. Uh, the experiments were conducted in three principal settings. One was on bench, or basically reverse engineering, and this is something I teach my students in electronics when we're doing diagnostics. Oftentimes, because we do not know what's in the black box, we do black box theory, which is basically we're looking at things like power, ground, signals, and if we force an input, uh, what what do we get for an output? Since as we went back to one of our uh, original questions is what at its most basic level does a computer do? It turns something on and off. Now it may turn it on and off in a very interesting fashion with like pulse width modulation or duty cycle control or things like that, but it still turns things on and off as a base function. So uh, reverse engineering is still a pretty reliable way if you have a similar product to kind of figure out how this thing's put together and if there are some sort of like security systems or things like that, how to defeat them. Uh, the other was using stationary, where the car was on jack stands at speed, simulating actual operation. And then finally, with a test driver uh, and on the road or actual road testing that was done at a decommissioned airport. And I thought that was rather interesting because in my past, I have uh, had a decommissioned airport to do, shall we say, road testing and experiments on at high rates of speed, which was kind of neat. Uh, they did something very similar, and uh, judging from if you read the full content of this study, uh, they needed something like this in order to conduct some of these tests because they literally took over many of the vehicle functions. All right, ready for the next slide, please. Okay, both vehicles use the CAN communications protocol. Now, I will tell you as an automotive technician that CAN is one of the greatest things when sliced bread for communicating large amounts of data compared to what we've been used to over a number of years for rather slow, uh, if you want to kind of make a comparison of slow internet speeds. Um, this is really uh, so much faster. Our scan tools load with data 
a lot faster for diagnostic purposes. There's a number of things that we can do uh, because of this CAN protocol, and it's a very robust uh, communications protocol and bus system. Um, having said that, it's not without its faults, and one of the things that the CAN protocol has is a number of inherent weaknesses that are common to any application, okay, whether, and CAN has been used on vehicles that uh, began, uh, Robert Bosch Corporation started pioneering this back in the late 80s, early 90s on a number of higher end European cars or entertainment for what we call the entertainment and comfort bus. And it's been used in industrial processes and manufacturing and industrial engineering for a number of years, uh, but it's, it's, Biggest problem is, particularly in an automotive application, CAN is extremely vulnerable to uh, denial of service or DOS attacks. Uh, CAN's priority-based format allows for like one single node to take a dominant state uh, on the bus indefinitely and can cause all other CAN nodes basically to back off or cease to communicate with each other or in many cases what we use in many CAN late model applications is uh, something called a gateway module, which is pretty much the traffic cop for one or more communication protocols. Uh, the major use of the CAN bus is providing diagnostic access to service technicians. Uh, CAN has three different transmission speed levels. We have CAN A, CAN B, and CAN C, with CAN C being the highest speed at a minimum of 500 kilobytes per second. Uh, that Typically, what we use uh, can see for um, scan tool interface, whether it's PC-based or whether it's a standalone scan tool, um, we have that, that actually provides like the highest level of speed of all the three available CAN buses. Uh, and many manufacturers use uh, CAN B and CAN C, but CAN C is normally associated with the uh, connection at, for those of you that are in the automotive field out there, Pins number six and 14 on the OBD data link connector are your CAN bus pins on uh, a CAN equipped vehicle. Uh, test equipment, i.e. scan tools, must be able to interrogate the internal state of vehicle components and at times manipulate this state as well. And this is where I added the, uh, the active or bi-directional testing function where I can actually sit in the driver's seat of a vehicle and turn all kinds of things on and off. I can lock and unlock the doors. I can operate the windshield wipers. I can make the windshield washer shoot washer fluid over top of the vehicle. Uh, I can start and stop the engine. I can turn individual fuel injectors or ignition coils on and off and a host of other things. I can turn the engine fans on and off on many vehicles. Now, I will tell you that these features are not available on all scan tools and they're certainly not available on all vehicles. And it normally is going to be in the realm of 96 and newer vehicles that have the OBD2 uh, J1979 SAE format. Uh, but there's a lot of them out there on the road. Even though there are numerous standards governing the CAN protocol and applications, it was found by this particular study group that the manufacturers do not always follow them. And this is especially true regarding things such as memory keys and challenge response authentication formats. That was another issue. Um, we can go to the next slide now, please. Okay, uh, some of the cyber attack methods used in this study, and I had to study myself when I was doing these because I am not uh, an IT person as such, so I had to look at what in the world packet sniffing, target probing, and particularly fuzzing was, and fuzzing was kind of, uh, I thought a rather interesting thing, and I wanted to explain that to my uh, my students. The packet sniffing and target probing are a little bit a little bit easier to understand. But fuzzing is a software technique uh, used to discover coding errors and security loopholes in software operating systems and networks by inputting massive amounts of random data, referred to as uh, fuzz, into the system to attempt to make it crash. So it's sort of like a shotgun approach. It would kind of be like a a five-year-old pressing every button on like a cipher key lock that they possibly could in the hopes that you know, maybe at some point they just get the right combination of things. But in this case, it would be something where you could actually very rapidly generate a lot of different data set, uh, signals, basically a lot of ones and zeros, and possibly 
unlock something in that particular module or device. And uh, that was one of the things they used. Many device control functions for select ECU, and we're talking about device control, this goes back to basically the active, uh, active testing or bidirectional testing capability that we're talking about. Um, could largely be discovered by fuzz testing, where we could, some of those things I described to you, where we could turn different outputs on and off and control it, uh, control the vehicle could be done. Uh, most of the attacks against the engine controller were found by fuzzing device control requests to the ECM. The same thing that technicians such as myself would use to get into the vehicle and use it for diagnostic purposes to actually activate different systems and outputs and things of that nature. Okay, we can move on to the next slide, please. Okay, it was also discovered that attack code could be written, and this is really one of the, I think, the most alarming parts, could be written in such a way as to execute an attack and then erase any evidence of its existence on the device. So that, let's say, computer IT forensics that would normally be used to find certain things might not be there. Like, we're so used to the types of, if you will, IT forensics where we can, you know, like the FBI, for instance, taking somebody's laptop, and even though they may have tried to erase something or things like that, there are different types of programs and different types of specialty skills out there that can actually pull things back that may have even been erased at one point. And apparently they tried to do something very similar on automotive controllers or modules and found that uh, they really couldn't establish any forensic evidence for the attack that they had created, that it was basically gone. And that's pretty scary. The study found that existing automotive con uh, software controlled systems appear to be very fragile. Based on the experiments performed, a fuzzing device or software is likely to be the most effective universal attack tool for disrupting these systems. And when they say fragile, that's not exactly, we think of fragile like, oh gosh, are these things all that fragile? Well, no. And to be honest with you, probably for the last uh, two decades or more, um, automotive electronics packages have been surprisingly robust. There's a very small level of failure uh, compared to earlier controllers that we had, particularly for engine controllers. That doesn't mean that they never fail because there's always different things out there that will create a failure. Um, one of the biggest problems we have that often generate a lot of what we call network codes uh, in vehicles is often something as simple as battery condition. With all the different, uh, let's say, uh, electrical electronic systems that we have on vehicles today, one of the things from a diagnostic standpoint that normally creates communication problems on networks between modules and everything else is normally ha may have its root cause in actual battery condition or lack of capacity. And uh, once that's straightened out, those problems go away very quickly. Uh, but in any event, moving down to the third bullet here, while automotive components are explicitly designed to tolerate failures, they are designed for durability and robustness, uh, shock and vibration, thermal cycling, getting hot, getting cold. It seems clear that tolerating attacks has not been part of the design criteria. In other words, like while the CAN bus is a wonderful tool used in the vehicle, nobody really thought about the fact that somebody can easily hack the CAN bus, which is one of the things is uh, vehicles become more complex, that there's a problem of that, that nature that exists. Many of the vulnerabilities discovered were made possible by weak or unenforced protections of diagnostic and reflashing services. And uh, again, this would be more like coding, uh, authentication keys, things of that nature. Um, I've reprogrammed numerous vehicles in the past, don't, uh, don't really do reprogramming myself anymore, but you know, it's not, uh, there, there are some different hoops you have to go through to get into it, but certainly for anybody that's, that's skilled or practiced in IT, and particularly for someone that, uh, let's say, is a hacker, um, not too hard to get around some of the, the very uh, light uh, security uh, systems we have in those vehicles, so to speak. And I believe, is this the last slide? Okay. I think that might be our last slide. 
Yep, okay. Well, time for Q&A. It looks like it. So uh, you ready for questions now, Reggie? Yes. We've got several here. I'm okay. sure you probably so, um, haven't slaughtered this subject too, too strenuously here. Well, I don't know if you've ever been able to uh, watch it while you've been speaking. I doubt you have, but there's been a very uh, enlivened discussion going on in the chat. So uh, that's been that's been uh, kind of interesting to to keep up with. So uh, I've, I've documented the questions here. I'm not going to uh, repeat all the comments because there's just been way too many comments. So the first one um, is from Jim. And he asked, what are the top three auto cyber vulnerabilities affecting business bottom line? Mm, okay, the top three. Uh, what auto, auto cyber vulnerabilities. All right, um, when we're talking about the business bottom line, can, can we kind of define what type of business we're talking about? Are we? So Jim, can you respond to that? What what what, what type of business are you talking about? Are you talking about the uh, uh, the vehicle manufacturing business? Um, he's saying uh, return on investment equals losing money. Okay, Rick. Now is this on? Okay, on the vehicle itself. I'm, I'm sorry, I may not be understanding the question correctly here. Um, he uh, so if he, he's uh, talking about affecting cost to the. Uh, uh, OEMs or real world. Oh yes. Well, you know that that's a great question. And like with anything, as we've experienced technological advance, oftentimes driven by, um, let's say, federal regulations. In the case of the Environmental Protection Agency, or in the case of of DOT, for instance, National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Um, and any other of these types of, of things, yes, the cost to manufacturers generally is always going to increase. Um, emission controls in and of itself has been uh, probably responsible for thousands of extra dollars of uh, investment on the vehicle. But when we consider that particular investment, and of course like anything else, it may take, in order let's say to come up with adequate uh, cybersecurity protections, like in the software and the coding realm, and that's really where most of this is going to be at. Some of it's hardware, but uh, the vast majority of it's probably going to be more in like like the software itself and the design of the software. Um, there's probably going to be, you know, obviously some initial expense in like, well, let's say, hardening a lot of these these possible vulnerabilities or attack avenues, uh, but. Having said that, once it gets developed, I don't think you're going to see that it's going to add significantly to the cost of the vehicle, okay? But any kind of initial, uh, if you will, change, regardless of what it is, particularly if it's something to do with emissions, safety, or, I mean, the corporate average fuel economy standards, that's added hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to uh, each, each unit, to each vehicle. Uh, because of, let's say, changes in technology and the cost of that technology. But the more we start implementing it, the more the engineers get to play around with it and come up with different lower cost solutions and better materials and things like that, typically the cost always comes down in technology over time. Okay. I hope that answered Jim's question. Yeah, he's, uh, he's, he, he likes your answer. He's a great answer. Okay. Uh, so he, he appreciated that. Thank uh, you. Jim, Jim, by the way, works for Raytheon Blackbird, he says. So. Oh, okay. All right. Very good. All right. So um, Jeremy asked, uh, and, and this question came early on in your presentation. Okay. Do these manufacturers operate this old software to have the systems communicate easier, such as if an engine needs to be replaced? Or is it so that the technician can use various non-OEM tools uh, connect to these systems to diagnose, diagnose and repair them? Okay, and that's a great question, yes. Some of this is so that, in other words, and a lot of this, again, goes back to federal legislation, uh, to different decisions that have been made, both at the, at the regulatory agency level, as well as, like, if you want to, through various laws uh, that have been passed in Congress and executive orders and things like that. And uh, a lot of this is so that the uh, aftermarket repair community uh, is not 
frozen out, so to speak, of the service and repair business. That's part of it. Um, because it relates to emissions and the importance of emission controls um, in, let's say, automotive technology, um, it, there is an access point. This is one of the reasons why OBD2 was developed. Um, a number of years ago, prior to OBD2, um, and OBD2, by the way, has been around since 1996, so we're almost coming up on the 25th anniversary in about another three or four years of OBD2 uh, full-blown implementation. And um, part of that is for technician access. Uh, as a matter of fact, almost anybody today can go online and Google search smartphone OBD tool scan tool software, and you can get a software app for as low as like $5, some of it's open source software, uh, if you feel comfortable with downloading that on your phone. Uh, and uh, you can get a dongle on Amazon for either a wired or a wireless unit like that uses Bluetooth for as low as about maybe 11 to 15 bucks. And you can turn your smartphone into a basic scan tool that most technicians are all going to have for interfacing with at least the engine controller today or the engine control module software. And uh, yes, so it is, it is done intentionally. It's done by uh, regulation to some extent that there needs to be some sort of common format. And one of the reasons is, is that um, I'm not going to say that the security part of it isn't important, but it's also the access part for vehicle repair is also an important aspect of that as well. And that, this is part of like, you know, again, like who has access to your vehicle, so to speak. But that's a great question. I, I really like that. But yes, a lot of this is, uh, is mandated by the federal government under uh, EPA regulations. So that's a great segue into the next question from uh, William. Uh, yes. Does OBD3 address cybersecurity? If not, why? Okay, and honestly, the, the phase one of OBD3 is OnStar and other telematics systems like OnStar. Um, that is basically where, and many of you probably are already aware of this, so I'm preaching to the choir probably, but with OBD2 and OnStar, we can actually take a vehicle. Let's say, for instance, somebody, if they can get into it, steals your vehicle. Now, a professional thief is probably going to have some very sophisticated hacking, hacking equipment and software of their own, um, and they will probably be able to get in and steal the vehicle, defeat whatever uh, OnStar interface and things like that are in there. But vehicle gets stolen, okay, or uh, an OnStar operator, if that is called in, can actually turn that vehicle off and it can go to the side of the road. They can shut the engine down. They can turn the fuel off to the engine. Um, the other piece to that is, is that, you know, you get locked out of your car. So OnStar can unlock the car. That really is OBD3. OBD2 is an advanced, if you will, or let's say, I want to say not really advanced, it's the next step in onboard diagnostics. It doesn't tell us as technicians everything that's wrong with a car, but it certainly points us in the right direction and tells us where to look. There's usually always another series of tests underneath that that we have to do. And a lot of times, we, in fact, we were just talking about this in my emissions class last night, the part store approach to a lot of uh, different diagnostic trouble codes that you will see that come up via those scan tools will actually, uh, you know, they'll say, oh, well, you've got this particular code. Oh, here, you need a pile of oxygen sensors and just replace all these and it'll fix it. And then, of course, the customer's sad when they do all that and it doesn't fix the problem because there's another underlying problem that's caught forcing those DTCs. Um, but, yeah, that's... Uh, it, it, it's definitely, um, well, I, I hope, hope I got that part of the question answered. There might be a, an add-on to that, but did that, that, uh, did that get the answer that uh, was needed? William, are, that's up to you. Are we there? Yeah, yeah you're here. Okay. You're here. So, uh, so Jer Jeremy has responded, yeah, William says yes, so we're good. Okay, so the next question okay. from Jim. All right, um, that's, I didn't know I answered it completely. Yep, I think I think you hit it. 
moving on to the next question, I'm, I'm not. I, this might be a little uh, uh, facetious. Can we use cyber to shut down the kids racing street bikes up and down my street? Oh. <laughs> um, before I moved to Virginia, <laughs> I used to live over in suburban Maryland, and uh, yes, I was treated every Friday and Saturday night to, uh, yeah, the uh, the crotch rockets. So yes, I'm very familiar with the desire to do something like that. I'd love to. Uh, unfortunately, bikes, even though uh, late model bikes do have like electronic fuel injection, in fact, what we call closed loop feedback electronic fuel injection, the level of sophistication on bikes at this point, now they do have uh, a number of newer bikes, Harley Davidson's, and I'm sure most of the other bikes like Victory and Kawasaki, Yamaha and Honda probably all have a, or it's a certain measure of onboard diagnostics, but compared to all the things that we currently have on a vehicle, um, except on some really high-end bikes, I don't think we'd find that same level of uh, electronic applications that we do on a on a passenger car or light truck. <laughs> okay, and Jim, I can tell you, uh, after spending a uh, a number of years in law enforcement, stop sticks do work. So uh, if you can get a hold of those, uh, they, they'll they'll solve the problem for you. Yeah. So the yeah. next question is from Gretchen. How do we get a hold of the two studies uh, you listed at the beginning of your presentation? That is a great question, and um, I can actually provide, um, I, I have that, that information here, and as a matter of fact, um, let me give you the address for those studies. I'll tell you what, why don't you uh, get Margaret to um, put it in the uh, chat window for you. Okay. And, uh, and then uh, that, that'll be there. That's work. And you can also, you can, you, uh, if you didn't get uh, Reggie's email address earlier, Margaret's put it in the chat window again. So um, absolutely, yeah, put that there. up there. And um, yeah, I, I can definitely send you more information. I actually uh, just preparing for today. I had gone through. I, I use Google search quite a bit for a number of things, uh, particularly in automotive technology, because again. Automotive technology, if you're getting bored, just wait a couple hours and something will change and there'll be something significantly new in terms of like a technological breakthrough or a new application or something like that. There's just so many things going on. Um, so one of the things I found that actually there was a, a couple of also interesting studies on vehicle security uh, that were, um, let's say, can I post these? You can post all that, yeah. Margaret's actually going to post uh, some of my web links from my most recent research on here uh, that I think will be very helpful, including the one that is uh, contains the Center for Automotive uh, Electronics System Security, uh, that joint study group, University of Washington, University of California. Um, she's going to put that on there. It's www.autosec.org. So that will be the one that contains uh, the two studies. And let me just quickly look in my folder here and give you the names of those two particular ones. The, the most recent one, uh, I, I have just been going through and reading, and I must confess, I haven't digested the entire study yet, but it definitely is a good addendum to the one on which the slides for today's presentation have been based. And it's called Compre Comprehensive Experimental Analyses of Automotive Attack Surfaces. And uh, it was done a year, I think about a year after they had done the original study um, on the, the one that we're, we've been using some of the data from and some of the information from that particular study. So, um, yeah, Margaret's going to put that up there for you guys now. Uh, the case list, is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh-huh. And... Uh, yeah, there's actually, let's see, yes, that's that's one about, um, there's already, if you do some Google searching about hacking into automotive systems, there's already some things on here that Margaret's going to put up up there for you, particularly if there's any, uh, any, for instance, like sport compact tuners or anybody like that, that out there in the group or bass fishermen that want to turn the uh, turbo boost up on your, uh, uh, your Ford pickup or things of that nature, so. But um, I'm ready for other questions if you have any more there. I've got three more here. 
So Lance asks, okay. do vehicles have, have access logs for forensics? Okay, that's a good question. Now, when you're saying access logs, um, uh, there's a lot of misconception and myths about the black box in a vehicle. And a black box in a, in a typical automobile, and there are a few exceptions to this, it's nothing like we have in aircraft or like on you know, railroad trains or locomotives or anything like that. It's nothing that sophisticated. There's not that level of information. However, embedded in something called the SRS, the Supplemental Restraint System, uh, AKA known as the airbag, and the airbag system today involves numerous airbags. Uh, I would say the average car, the average 2017 model car today probably has um, just a huge number, of, probably like a, as many as a dozen different types of like frontal, side curtain uh, airbags that are built into the sides of it and everything else. So kind of, you know, it's almost like being in a great big pillow if all these things have to deploy, so to speak. Um, embedded in that SRS controller or module, there are basic vehicle data about speed, G-forces, um, let's say brake application, like when were the brakes applied, things like that. So there's a lot of data and it typically, and when, when I say that, I, let me qualify that, I'm going to say a lot of data, not data relevant to a crash event where the airbags have actually deployed. Uh, those are normally retrievable by law enforcement using a tool called the Vitronics uh, Event Data Recorder or EDR. Uh, there's actually an on, there's a couple of different, like you can YouTube it or you can uh, actually Google search it online. I use it in some of my classes. Uh, but there are actually, when I'm teaching uh, airbag or supplemental restraint, uh, restraint system um, you know, diagnosis and repair, but it's their event data recorders. And again, they're typically used by law enforcement and insurance companies uh, to extract that minimal data, I should say, that's available on the vehicle in the event of an airbag deployment. But that's about it. Okay. Uh, next question from David. Which mm -hmm. OBD2 slash CAN bus scanners do you use or recommend? Okay, um, there's, it depends on how much money you want to spend. Um, when you get into CAN bus, you can buy something. One of, I have, um, I have a part-time business. I have mostly focusing on diagnostics and drivability. Um, and I have several different scan tools I use and recommend to my students. Uh, obviously, here at the college, we have a plethora of both, most of our scan tools are a tad more expensive. We have manufacturer scan tools here and things like that. But I would probably say for um, access and functionality, and I don't want to get into trouble here plugging any particular products or things like that, because there's a number of really good uh, different types of scan tools out there, and I will tell you from personal experience and years of using them, like probably over three decades or around three decades, that uh, you know the most expensive tool isn't always the best one. And one tool doesn't always work for every vehicle the way that maybe another tool might. So there's some vehicles that do very well. The one that I found for the money that actually works the best and gives you a lot of functionality for a relatively low price is the Autel, A-U-T-E-L, Maxidaz DS708 scan tool. Uh, they're available, you can get them all day long pretty much on Amazon or eBay right now for about $850 to $900. And uh, they normally, the package will include a year of free updates. So, uh, and Autel usually updates that software at least once or twice a month. Um, that's my recommendation. Okay. If, if you want to. Um, and the last question I have. Yep, I'm sorry, go ahead. <coughs> go ahead. No, I. You I'm, finish up. Well, I just, <laughs> just wanted to mention that that's, uh, but if you want something more basic that's a good 
uh, just simply will get you into the engine controller and has maybe a few other little functions and you don't want to spend a lot of money. Uh, for under $200, you can get an Actron CP9580A or Alpha. Uh, that's an Actron CP Charlie Paul 9580A Alpha, and they may even have a B uh, beta uh, version out now as well. Uh, that scan tool will get you into any CAN bus system for under 200 bucks. But just remember, it's only going to go into the engine controller, and generally you're not going to be able to turn things on and off, do any kind of, uh, any kind of active testing, if you will. With the Autel Maxi DAS, the DS708, you can actually, on many cars, turn things on and off, which is a really awesome feature if you're, you know, doing diagnostics or repair. Okay, I'm sorry, Larry, go ahead and I'm ready for your next question. Not a problem. So the, the last question I have is, do you see the prevalence of the use of LTE connectivity as a major security issue, more so than things like OnStar, et cetera? Okay, um, could you could you please for for your questioner, uh, could they please define what they mean by LTE? Because that's a term I'm not familiar with. So that's the uh, the 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 latest generation of um, uh, cellular connectivity. Oh, okay. That that could be that could be why I'm I'm not familiar with it because I'm embarrassed to show you all my uh, my flip phone, but I can assure you it's mil spec 810G and uh, relatively hack proof. So uh, I, I, I kind of like it, and I don't break it as easily as I do a smartphone. My last smartphone, you wouldn't want to see it. It looked pretty ugly. But uh, in any event, um, yeah, with a smartphone platform, um, this, this is kind of one of the challenges right now because, you know, I know smartphones are pretty well encrypted where they're, they're, they're more difficult to hack, let's say, than maybe like a laptop and things. But, you know, that's the problem with any of these things. And unfortunately, as we, we build more layers of security and we come up with ways to kind of, uh, you know, make them less accessible to unauthorized individuals, um, you know, there's still going to be people that are going to probably find some relatively inexpensive way around it. Um, I, I, I uh, I don't know if that answered the question, and if, if not, I'll certainly try and frame it a little bit better. I don't, uh, I'm assuming it did answer the question. So, yes, it makes sense, he says. Great. Okay. All right. Yes. And, you know, that that's basically the thing. Any of these external devices that we integrate with the vehicle, whether it's through Bluetooth, whether it's through cabling, like, you know, like a LAN cable or anything like that in the vehicle or a USB cable, um, you know, we're, we're, we're taking something that could, if it's infected with malware, either pre-infected or it's an avenue for current infection or future infection, there's always that possibility that we're going to be able to get into those systems. There's one thing I did want to address, uh, and we're talking to Lewis, right? Yeah. yeah, Lewis, there is one thing I did want to address for uh, one final thing here uh, I think I should mention. Uh, General Motors, if people are still listening here, General Motors does have something that they've come out with for the 2017 Chevy Camaro SS. It's called a Serial Data Gateway Module description, uh, and what this actually does it both through firmware as well as software actually isolates some of the, let's say, some of these systems like the telematics, like the OnStar, the infotainment systems, and other avenues for a potential attack threat or an attack avenue, uh, and actually isolates those from engine controls, vehicle stability and braking controls, uh, the adaptive cruise control functions, so there's less, it, it's another layer, let's say, to protect the vehicle against those types of attacks that were outlined in this study from CAESS. So I, I did want to mention that. Um, now, do we have any other questions, Lewis? Yeah, there's, there's one more here that I'll throw out um, from yeah. here. Let me go ahead and get that first, and then I've got a follow-up here, too, I want to give you guys as well. 
Okay, uh, he's asking about uh, what about poisoned Android phones interfacing, or when he says poison, he's referring to uh, Android phones that have been infected with some type of virus interfacing and transferring to the Android entertainment centers. He's seen the uh, Bluetooth 3 connection poison the media center, uh, and there's no antivirus for cars yet. So how would you address that? Yes, that th this is this is a really I would say probably one of the biggest problems that, that we've got is because where we're so used to with our laptops and most of our, our personal devices and things where, you know, whether it's like a WinBook or a tablet or anything else, that there's usually some kind of antivirus program that we can download and fix our machine. And at this point in time, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I mean, I do a lot of like leading edge automotive electronics things. And uh, I, I don't know of anything like a cleaner, if you will, or uh, let's say malware uh, remover that we can actually get in and clean those systems out. Now, the manufacturers may have something short of actually replacing the entire unit, um, but that's something at this point, I, I don't think anyone's really developed that kind of software. And again, is uh, hopefully, a lot of you guys will be interested enough to go to the www.autosec.org site that uh, uh, Margaret's put up for you guys uh, and take a look at these studies. I think for some of you that are much more versed in IT issues than I am, uh, we'll probably be able to take a look at some of these things and you'll be able to, to figure out some for defensive measures, if you will, that you can take. But that is definitely like an infected or a poisoned cell phone is one of the vectors that could potentially, uh, except on some of the very latest and most recent systems that have like this Camaro SS firmware firewall in it, um, you know, it, it, it could infect even more systems or create problems in the vehicle depending on the ingenuity and the objectives of the hacker. So hopefully that answered the question. I think it did. Okay. So, so you've got some closing comments, uh, Reggie? Yes, I, I just had a couple of things here that maybe people might want to be interest, uh, maybe interested in, in terms of a couple of actual standards that are out in the industry right now for, uh, for vehicle cybersecurity. Um, and let me just cite those for you guys here as to what they are. Uh, there's a pretty broad standard that deals with functional safety of road vehicles, and this is an ISO, International Standards Organization, uh, standard uh, that covers the cybersecurity process, although I don't know how specifically, but it is ISO 26262. And to the best of my knowledge, that is currently a published uh, standard. Now, on the SAE side, because in things automotive, generally we always have ISO standards and we have accompanying or corroborating SAE, Society of Automotive Engineers standard, and there's currently an SAE standard J3061. However, that has not been published yet. It is listed as a WIP and that means in SAE speak that it is a, a work in progress. So it is not a completed standard as of yet. And I think it may be more specific and targeted to vehicle electronics and particularly communications and attack avenues uh, than the ISO standard. Well, the ISO standard is pretty broad. So I just wanted to kind of finish up with that because there are a couple of standards out here right now that are governing that. And the manufacturers are starting to realize, I think, largely from these studies done by University of Washington and uh, University of California, San Diego, that they, they've got some work to do when it comes to vehicle cybersecurity. The biggest reason we probably don't see more of it right now is because it would pretty much be targeted toward, let's say, uh, if you will, someone that might want to do harm to a specific individual, kind of like AKA cutting brake lines, things like that, the old days. Um, 
or messing around with somebody's wiring under the hood and things of that sort of thing, or stealing a car uh, because there's the economic, um, like what economic benefit is there to the uh, to the attacker for doing this? Where the money really is in things of attacking things like online banking and credit card accounts and personal information and all those type of things, or military secrets, or all those items, or or industrial espionage. So there, there's a little bit more of a limited target here, and that's probably one of the reasons why it hasn't been as big an issue as it may become as we start moving more into integrating a lot of these let's say, personal electronics devices into the vehicle platform, if you will. So that's pretty much it, I think, at this point in time, but um, it, it, it obviously is a work in progress uh, for the manufacturers. Uh, I think it's going to be a work in progress for the cybersecurity community as we start to see different things uh, in the automotive realm start to expand a bit here. Uh, in terms of functionality, and particularly as we seem to be marching towards some form of vehicle autonomy, uh, and certainly infotainment and things of that nature, more more features on the vehicle. So, uh, and one thing I didn't mention, electric vehicles aren't immune from any of these things either, as you probably might imagine, because uh, electric vehicles, if you're out somewhere and using a charging station, you actually have a... Uh, a software interface with the uh, with the charging station if you hook up to a public charging station with an electric vehicle. So just want to throw that out there too. It's a cheery thought. Yes, cheery thoughts. <laughs> All righty, great. Uh, so thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, that's that's a fantastic presentation, uh, and thank you to your. Sidekick there, Margaret Leary, the award-winning Margaret Leary. I, I, could, I could not have done it without her, believe me. I am just the puppet on the string here. So I'm, she's done all the, all the hard work. Awesome. So, and thanks for everybody for joining us today. Uh, thanks well, to everybody for joining us today. And uh, thank you for your patience with our technical issues uh, earlier. Um, be sure to look for a link that will come to your email. Uh, address that you used when you signed in today that will have uh, links to today's recording as and the recording will include the uh, the chat information and um, also the uh, the email will include or the you'll get a link to the uh, meeting space which will have a link to the recording the chat uh, uh, window all the all the information that's been put in there as well as the uh, slides themselves that have been used. Uh, you can always uh, check out past webinars uh, that we've had on our website at nationalcyberwatch.org and also on our YouTube channel, and you see the uh, link to our YouTube channel there on your screen. Thanks again for joining us. We appreciate you being here, and we'll look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank Have a great you. day. All right. Bye. So we'll Thank you.